Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Dear students, hope you all are doing well. Welcome to another very exciting session of the course Soft Tissue Characterization and Applications. So we had been in discussing uh, about the different soft tissue simulants. Uh, we talked about quite a few exciting soft tissue simulants like the skin and the brain. So we are going to continue on that and learn about a few more soft tissue simulants uh, which have been developed to date as well as uh, discuss quite a few uh, really good applications, right? So let's get started. Okay, so the next soft tissue simulant is for the calcineal fat pad. Calcineal fat pad is a natural uh, soft tissue uh, which, uh, which is there at the bottom of your heel, of the heel of your foot. So calcineal fat pad is something which acts as a cushion while you're walking, running and doing all daily activities. So it undergoes a lot of cyclic and, uh, you know, fatigue kind of loads, uh, loading cycles like uh, throughout your lifetime. So if this is overstressed at a certain point, the calcineal fat pad can get damaged, right? So uh, the motivation here was uh, for the problem of plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis is a very common term used for heel pain, basically. And it also encompasses other sorts of foot pain uh, which are on the plantar or the bottom region of the foot such as the arch pain or the uh, pain due to um, pain on the toes due to uh, di uneven distribution of pressures and whatnot. But a calcineal fat pad here is uh, a soft tissue which is of uh, high importance. So uh, in plantar fasciitis, if this calcineal fat pad gets damaged, the pain can intensify and uh, sometimes the incidences of plantar fasciitis is due to the calcineal fat pad damage, right? So uh, with that motivation, we also wanted to look at uh, what is a normal calcineal fat condition? What is the condition of uh, the fat pad for uh, people or patients with uh, plantar heel pain? also in people with diabetes, right? So diabetes has a very common uh, implication of uh, affecting the foot uh, due to something which is known as neuropathy where uh, there is uh, uh, no nerve sensation or no sensation at the bottom of the foot and the material of the foot also changes, right? So these three uh, normal condition, plantar heel pain condition as well as the diabetic condition, this is where the calcineal fat pad properties have a clear role to play, right? Like in terms of uh, how well they are done, right? So we wanted to create some soft tissue simulants uh, for the calcineal fat pad. Of course, we cannot take this fat pad out of a uh, cadaver or a human body that easily. So we wanted to um, basically create some simulants. And uh, one purpose was to study uh, the calcineal fat pad properties in normal uh, and diseased conditions like in with plantar heel pain and diabetes, as well as these uh, sometimes we can uh, develop a product which is known as a fat pad cushion in cases where the fat pad is damaged and that can be uh, worn uh, just like an insole uh, or can form the part of a heel cup in an insole and provide the right cushioning which is missing due to the damage damaging of the fat pad right so these were the two different uh, motivations one is the study of the biomechanics and the properties second is for product development right so with this motivation, we started developing and uh, the calcineal fat pad uh, simulant. So here the fabrication methodology was uh, very similar to the other soft simulants. We looked at four part silicon, which has uh, worked pretty well for us for the most uh, soft tissue mimicking uh, because it provides a range of very soft properties to very high stiffness properties and also has a very clearly um, elastic and uh, kind of a hyper elastic response uh, with a highly non-linear touch, right? So the four part silicon mixture was again with the two different sets of silicon, one with the shore hardness of 10A in the shore hardness A scale 
typically this shore hardness value is measured using a durometer. Durometer is a measurement device which you place, it has a small indenter and you can place it on any of the soft materials to measure a shore hardness, right. 30A is a little higher on the shore hardness, right, they, they were all mixed in different ratios, right. That gave us a bunch of specimens, this time we did not test it under tensile loads, but we tested it under compression loads because that is what the heel pad is going to get subjected to while you walk or run or stand. You know, so, uh, the heel pad dimensions were selected, uh, the heel pad simulant dimensions were basically selected based on uh, review of actual studies where the real heel pad was extracted from a cadaver and tested, right. Uh, and also the properties were extracted from that literature to compare with our results. So, uh, a diameter of uh, 60 millimeter was uh, selected uh, and a depth of closely uh, 18 millimeters was selected for this, right. The tests were conducted at two different strain rates uh, going from 0 0.8 meters, uh, millimeters per second, meters is very high and 1.9 millimeters per second, fairly low, right. Then uh, the heel pads were also subjected to cyclic strain rates, right, like where you have loading and unloading of, uh, you know, like. Uh, the loads, right. So, this was conducted at a 1.96 millimeter per second. So, it is a very slowly loading and unloading. Then very high strain rates were also applied in the order of 180 to 1800 millimeters per second. So, 1800 is almost millimeters, it is almost like a 1.8 meter per second, that is a lot, right. So, these kind of very high strain rates were also applied. Uh, why were this specific numbers selected? Because uh, the strain rates had to be the same with what has been done in literature for testing and that is the only way we can compare apple to apple uh, the stress strain plots or the load deformation plots, right. So, that, that was the purpose. So, the tissues we had simulated uh, using the different uh, soft tissue simulants uh, developed were the healthy fat pad, the disease fat pad under diabetes and the disease fat pad under plantar fasciitis, right. So, uh, on the figure on the top, you can see a very quick schematic of where the calcineal fat pad is and uh, some of the samples which we have developed, uh, which are round samples with a certain depth, right. Then they were placed within a UTM uh, again and uh, that was under compression load. So, we had to uh, do a few things extra to create the right setup so that uh, there are two flat ends under which the compression happens and that is that is where the uh, calcineal fat pad simulant is sandwiched in between, right. So, mechanical tests were conducted in all the uh, declared uh, strain rates and uh, what we found out as a final set of results and the comparison with the literature is all captured in the plot on the bottom right. So, you are looking at the healthy control which is the very um, thick dark line. This is uh, derived from the Tong et al. Tong et al is uh, one of the research groups uh, with Dr. Tong as uh, one of the key uh, principal investigators where they have looked at healthy control, uh, healthy control is same as healthy uh, calcineal fat pads. They have extracted it from cadavers and they have tested it uh, across these uh, strain rates, right, under compression. The second is uh, Plantar heel pain, uh, this, this is the uh, medium thickness black line and that this is also done as a part of the research by Tong et al. Uh, the third one is diabetes. So, third one is diabetes which is also performed by Tong et al's research group which is the thin uh, black line. All these three lines you are looking at are with error bars, right. Error bars basically means these were uh, out of the many tests or mechanical tests which were conducted, the results kind of were distributed across a certain range, right. So, that is that is the error bar uh, when you took out several different samples from different cadavers, right. And uh, then this is followed by all the colored lines which um, represent all the different compositions which we have developed to uh, simulate the calcineal fat pad. And uh, we had developed this with the intention of just going from a softer hardness material to a uh, higher stiffer hardness material and uh, this was done iteratively. We increased the composition and the hardness and finally, uh, the uh, different plots which we had derived from the literature were compared with our compositions and the compositions which were very close to the literature within the error bars were considered as simulants which describes 
either the healthy control, the plantar heel pain uh, condition or the diabetic condition of the calcineal fat pack, right. So, this is how a uh, quasi-static normal UTM test was conducted, right. And uh, this is, uh, this work is again published as a part of uh, our research in the journal Biomimetics. You are welcome to look at it. The um, uh, details of the publication are as uh, at the very bottom, right. Okay. So, uh, this uh, calcineal fat pad simulants which we had developed were also subjected to cyclic and very high strain uh, test based loadings. Uh, so, the figure on the left you are looking at the cyclic loading where you have the healthy con control. Uh, this is from uh, another research which is uh, done by Fontanella uh, et al. Uh, this is their research group in the loading and unloading phase they have taken uh, quite a few measurements. So, these people did uh, you know like uh, research on the cyclic uh, kinds of loading, right. So, we had uh, developed this uh, one uh, control composition to mimic the uh, specific uh, force displacement response and this was the surrogate with the configuration 60, 20, 10, 10 and this basically represents the different ratios uh, by weight of the two mixture amounts of the two different sets of silicon, right. So, under loading and unloading. When, whenever you conduct a cyclic loading kind of a uh, condition, there is typically uh, the plot kind of uh, has a little bit of extra curve to it and there is an area uh, which you can highlight between the loading cycle and the unloading cycle, right. This is typically the energy absorption of the, uh, of, of the system, right, like due to the cyclic, un uh, cyclic loading and unloading. Similar observations were uh, seen like for our surrogate and it compared fairly well. So, you are looking at the dark uh, gray or back blackish lines for the literature values and you are looking at the colored lines for the loading, red one is for loading and uh, green one is for unloading, right. So, um, most of the results were within the error bars that indicated that our simulant was fairly uh, good to simulate the cyclic conditions. The next one was uh, we wanted to conduct the tests uh, with the uh, surrogate 60, 20, 10, 10 only uh, because we define this as a control surrogate which we want to test it across different strain rates, you know repeatability, reproducibility, cyclic loading. So, we have to always pinpoint one surrogate composition which we are going to test extensively, right. Rest of them are for just finding where the surrogate composition should lie. So, first of all we hit and trial find the necessary that the surrogate composition should be from 30 percent of A to 35 percent of A. Uh, let us say 32 percent of B to 32.5 percent of B, these kind of compositions which we have for the four parts. And after once we have pinpointed this, we figure out a healthy uh, or a control uh, specimen and which we compare it across different tests, right. So, we did the same. Uh, here uh, we derive some of the um, uh, literature values uh, where uh, Grig uh, Grigordius uh, is uh, another researcher, Grigordius et al. Uh, their group had basically studied calcineal fat pad from the real cadavers uh, at the different strain rates of 1.96, 180 and 1800 millimeters per second, right. So, we also subjected our same control surrogate to these three different strain rates and we found some results which were fairly comparable as you, as you can see in the plots, right. So, uh, the black dark line is for the 1.96 millimeters per second strain rate and the green one, uh, the green uh, our surrogate composition or the simulant composition was almost very close, almost like an overlap, right. Similar with the dashed lines at a 180 millimeters per second and uh, also the blue line was able to capture it. When you went for 1800 millimeters per second, uh, the uh, uh, dotted line uh, which, which is the uh, value from the literature was not very far, right. So, two things to note here is first is I had uh, explain this uh, quite a bit like in the previous classes that whenever you increase the strain rate, the rate at which you are applying the loading, the rate at which you are applying the displacements, the property of the material or the response of the uh, material be it a soft material or a tissue completely changes, it, it becomes much more stiff. So, that is exactly what we are seeing here. When we increase the strain rate from 1.96 to 1800, it has drastically increased, right. Uh, so, uh, is that increase also observed in um, 
simulants such as uh, isotropic simulants like built with silicon yes we have we are seeing that that is number two but we are seeing some differences in the response because uh, in the actual tissue you have fibers so it behaves a little differently when it is subjected to very high strain rates whereas in the uh, silicon based simulant you do not have fibers so there would be some difference between the actual specimen response and the uh, simulant response and that is exactly what we saw right here so next tissue simulant which we developed was for a little bit of different purpose this is known as an artificial heel surrogate this is kind of an adaptation from the calcineal heel pad so we took the properties of the calcineal heel pad but we wanted to create the structure of the human heel right and what was the purpose here the purpose here was not to just do a compression test which we have already done for the calcineal heat pad but to do some friction test we wanted to look at barefoot slips and fall conditions right so if you are walking barefoot on a particular flooring and there is a water spill or an oil spill do you have a high chance of slipping that is what we wanted to uh, basically measure right so we developed a very novel uh, human heel surrogate or a artificial heel surrogate uh, this has been filed for patent again so uh, the way this was done was we actually scanned the foot of a person and based on that we did some post processing with the scan and we could create uh, extract the shape of the heel which is usually of concern and which uh, is a part of the uh, slipping condition so when when you actually slip you are basically you slip at a heel strike typically so once you have your heel is struck like on the ground all of a sudden uh, there is lack of friction between the ground and the uh, heel and uh, due to the contaminant which is water or oil in this case it's even worse and then you have a slipping or uh, lack of friction right so that's a similar uh, we wanted to pinpoint what region of the foot is of concern and that is exactly what we extracted and we created a negative mold of that uh, using 3d printing which you can see on the figure on the top left right and then we have to build a connector this is uh, for the purpose of connecting it with a slip testing device uh, these are typically devices uh, it's known as a british pendulum tester this is commonly used in the airports right airports for testing whether the ground is safe for the flight uh, wheels to land is it giving enough traction for the wheels so in a rainy day and the traction may go down right so these slip testing devices are commonly used across the industry we wanted to modify that device to incorporate um, this human heel uh, simulant and run some tests on the same right so we created this uh, top right you can see two uh, uh, this human heel simulants which not only mimics the properties of the calcineal heel pad uh, but also the structure of the human heel right and we then uh, connected them with the connector right the connector was built separately and was assembled and finally the system was all assembled into the british pendulum tester so this allowed us to test the heel surrogate in various slips and fall conditions so the beauty of this is now with this slip uh, slip design like slip testing design we can take this entire portable slip testing device to any flooring be it in a kitchen flooring or a uh, you know like hospital flooring be it in any other places like where there is a possible or a bathroom flooring where you have a barefoot condition or flooring of a bathtub for example or flooring of a swimming pool so these were all the possible locations where we can place this device and quickly take a measurement because we already have the biofidelic or uh, the heel uh, model which simulates the actual human heel and also its properties so all we need is the flooring and the liquid which is uh, in case of a swimming pool or bathroom it's water in bathroom it could be shampoo solution or soap solution so things like that so we could test it uh, run a battery of tests like two three hundred tests to uh, find out different uh, results and uh, declare which floorings are safe which floorings are not for let's say the bathroom or the swimming pool and things like that so this was part of a pilot study and ongoing research uh, in the areas of slips and falls but here also we have uh, beautifully used an artificial human heel surrogate to understand the mechanical properties right the next one is an artificial anisotropic tissue 
so uh, so far what we have been talking about is an artificial isotropic issue Our isotropic means it's a single material uh, whether you pull the specimen from this side or that side or from the top to bottom it's going to behave the same right because it's a single material now we wanted to create a little bit closer version to what a soft tissue should look like so we introduced uh, artificial and isotropic tissues and we created some very crude uh, fundamental versions of uh, these tissue uh, mimics right so the way we did this was we uh, selected two different silicon materials right and uh, one was a softer material and one was the harder material uh, the 10a and 30a and uh, we had basically considered that the uh, will create fibers with the harder material and we will have these fibers embedded within the softer matrix to give it the same definition of how we define uh, any soft tissue macroscopically right we define it as a uh, soft composite right like which is fibers within a softer matrix right so to kind of have that definition uh, uh, you know designed we wanted to uh, build this uh, anisotropic soft tissue simulant we took some specimens and we tested the materials by themselves and then created the different embedding uh, embodiments like of the different uh, fibers uh, or the fiber locations or the fiber volume fractions uh, which are uh, embedded within the softer material so these are the four different types of tests uh, which we conducted uh, so when we increase the fiber volume fraction what is this fiber volume fraction so fiber volume fraction is how much amount of the total volume of the sample is filled with fibers right so that's a very clear definition so if we have a very low fiber volume fraction of uh, 0.17 which you see on the uh, figure on the very top left the first figure uh, that means the fiber is either narrow or you have a very small population of fibers right so here we just uh, worked with some bulk fibers to just understand the fundamental concepts of what happens when you have a hard material within a soft material specifically uh, to simulate skin right so uh, we changed the fiber volume fraction as uh, as intuitive uh, we found the results to change uh, the stiffness increased drastically when the amount of fibers or the amount of harder material within the softer material uh, was increased right which we can see very clearly in the uh, top right, top left uh, figure then the next is uh, when we uh, increase the fiber spacing so if you have a lot of fibers uh, same size fibers same thickness fibers uh, going across the length and we increase the fiber spacing that means we can accommodate a very few fibers so due to large spaces the fib uh, the overall property of the sample is going to get much more compliant or less stiff so the property is going to go down right that's the next set of tests which we did the third set of tests was increasing the number of fibers right if you want to club in a lot of fibers within the same space and all the fibers are equally width right equal width so then when we have a lot of fibers uh, directed towards the longitudinal axis of the test of course the property will go up it stiffens up right and the fourth one is when we change the angle of the fibers so fibers directed towards the direction of test which is longitudinal versus orthogonal 90 degree to that and all the angles in between we wanted to see the effect and it's very intuitive like when the fibers are straight forward towards the direction of loading it's going to behave much more stiffer right and that's what we saw in the results so we just wanted to lay down this fundamental understandings uh, again with the soft tissue simulants uh, to just develop the foundation right this is also uh, published as a part of our research in applied bionics and biomechanics this is a, a detail of the paper you're welcome to look at it right okay then we uh, as we evolved we have been able to create advanced artificial and isotropic tissues where uh, if you look at most of the artificial tissues in the slide here you're looking at majorly very crude kind of setups like where some fibers are cut in a way like they're cut with scissors or things like that and they've just put to get a fundamental understanding now if you look at the fibers on the top four specimens you can see very clearly uh, so one set of fiber is going at a zero degree then at a certain degree the angle keeps on increasing and it's a very smooth kind of setup right but uh, this has been uh, made using additive manufacturing where all the dark lines are representing fibers of a different property okay 
and the rest of it like which is a little whitish or uh, lighter in color uh, depicts the matrix. So, this is a two material system with fibers embedded in the matrix, but looks much more smoother and nicer right. Then we have used this anisotropic tissue simulants which are highly advanced this is also published uh, quite well. Uh, we have used them to study the, uh, the mechanics of skin grafts which I am going to just showcase uh, as a very quick snapshot of what skin grafting is. But skin grafts are where you have incisions or slits or holes within the uh, soft tissue and uh, you want to create a large amount of expansion. So, this is using biaxial testing we are looking at the skin graft property or uh, creating is trying to create a skin graft simulant. The purpose here is to understand the skin graft expansion basically not to have something which is replacing a graft or transplanting not for that purpose this is for biomechanical purely biomechanical study right. So, these are some advanced artificial anisotropic tissues which we can come up after a lot of research right. So, let us look at some of the applications so very uh, notable applications in the area of surgery uh, which can be uh, beneficial using the soft tissue simulants. So, the first set of uh, uh, you know like examples are to understand soft tissue damage and repair. repair. So, one of the motivation here was uh, we get all different sorts of wounds due to cuts or uh, some form of injury. But have we ever analyzed the wounds? Why do we need to analyze the wounds? Because every wound needs a very different attention. If you have a small scratch, it will heal by itself. But if you have a wound which is really a deep cut which needs some form of stitching or surgical intervention, then there needs to be a standard practice that if the wound is of this much size, this much width, then this much amount of suturing or this much amount of suture force should be placed. These kind of standards do not exist. So, most majority of the suturing which goes on uh, up to date is all based on a surgeon's experience. If you go to a uh, new person who has been in the uh, you know practice who has been practicing for a year or two they will basically stitch it in a very different way versus a doctor or surgeon whom uh, had been doing this for last 20 years right. So, why do we want to standardize practices this is very important because this this way we can speak a common language and even the new medical practitioners or doctors across borders, they can have now a common practice or a guideline at least that if a wound is of a certain size this much length this kind of suturing practices are much more beneficial. That will eventually only help the patients because the wounds will heal much more quickly. This is number one. Second is if we have these kind of standardized practices we can feed this information to a robot. Uh, which is going to perform a lot of robotic surgeries in the uh, upcoming years right. So, with this two primary motivations we wanted to study that what are the some of the different wound shapes which we commonly encounter in uh, literature or uh, which uh, many of us commonly get and how uh, all the deep wound shape and how they can be sutured and how this overall affects the mechanical property of the tissue when during the wound and after it is being sutured. Right. So, we did a very thorough uh, biomechanical study to understand all these properties and this could only be achieved through the development of a soft tissue simulant which in this case is a skin simulant right. So, we created artificial human skin uh, simulants and we uh, generated different wound geometries long and short uh, also the wounds were located across top bottom and uh, center. Uh, these these wound shapes were all derived from literature and uh, based on that we had uh, run some solutions right. We had placed on this wounds interrupted sutures this is a type of suturing technique where you have one suture you end that suture you place another suture then you place the third suture right. And another technique uh, very common technique is the continuous suture where you keep on suturing you take the thread and you keep on suturing here 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 here. Why did we choose interrupted suture because this is commonly uh, you know observed or commonly practiced uh, almost as much as a continuous suture. But another reason was uh, we were not experts in suturing. So, at that time we thought interrupted suture is something which we can place in a better way right. To be as close as to a real uh, soft tissue suturing or a skin suturing condition as possible right. We wanted to be as close as possible to the real scenario otherwise the study is of no use. So, uh, 
we also defined uh, something which is known as a hyperelastic relationship. I am going to have a session dedicated to hyperelastic models what they are. So, let us skip this for now the hyperelastic mathematical equation component. Uh, but let us focus on the blue uh, region. So, uh, the first one is known as a tissue phantom or an artificial skin or a skin simulant right. This is what we developed first. This was followed by a tissue phantom with the wound right. So, we had now created the wounds and the third one this is just a representative of all the samples which we have tested right. The third one is a tissue phantom with suture. So, now we have placed the suture and uh, what we are seeing on the right side is all the microscopic images of all the different wound types right. So, we have clearly demarcated the lengths and we have uh, noted down the different measurements of the wound and based on that we have classified them as either a long wound or a short wound and a top center bottom kind of wound, right. So, uh, with this nice uh, set of experimental samples we started testing and we found some very interesting results, right. Uh, so, in the plot on the very left what we saw was the average stress versus strain for an unwounded and wounded specimen. So, we took the average of all the responses mechanical responses which we got from testing of all the wounded and the unwounded specimen. Unwounded is the skin simulant by itself right and all the wounds are different shapes of wounds. We took the overall properties and kind of took an average of that with the error bars. So, when we compared them we could see a very clear demarcation between the wounded samples as well as the un unwounded samples. So, we can very clearly see the wounded samples at a property much lower right even the error bars are coming lower which is fairly intuitive if if a skin is wounded the property mechanical property will degrade. So, it was quite intuitive and straightforward. If the results would have been otherwise then it would have been a concern for our research technique or uh, the methods which we are using but this was okay. Uh, the next one is uh, the figure on the right where we compared not only the unwounded phantom, but also the wounded phantom and the sutured phantoms like the average values of that. So, very interesting result if you see here uh, while the wounded ones uh, had properties much lower than the unwounded ones or the natural uh, simulant ones. Uh, once you have sutured them right. So, the sutured one is the dark line you are looking at a property much higher than the original simulant. So, that means with suturing the overall material property of the skin becomes much more stiff than its natural version which is also intuitive because you are used placing a suture material which is much more harder than the actual tissue right. But this was a very clear finding which we got and we could clearly say that our research results or the methods are accurate right. So, we saw all the sutured specimens showing much more higher stiffness. Okay, the next thing is so far what we have done in this research is we have only looked at the UTM best over overall deformation load versus deformation. What you do not see here is what is happening within the tissue. So, irrespective of how the wound is whether it is in circular hole or it is a square hole or whatever is going on all you are getting is a overall response. So, sometimes if you do not know what the wound size is or the shape is you cannot predict back from a response that what could be the possible uh, you know like uh, uh, wound shape or size right. So, it cannot be backtracked. So, we wanted to look a little bit closer into the wound that what is happening with the different wound shapes. The overall response is all great overall properties we understand what is happening at a local level. This is known as local soft tissue mechanics right. So, let me just give you a very brief introduction into lo the local soft tissue mechanics and I am then going to talk about this technique which is a very unique technique at length in one of the upcoming sessions right. This is known as local damage study using digital image correlation. This is an imaging technique known as DIC quite commonly. So, in this technique what happens is you try to track uh, the local strains which are developing. Uh, during a test right during an experimental test. The way we did this was you make uh, different artificial human skin compositions like that is a standard uh, tissue simulant specimen. Then uh, you create the wounds specifically in all the uh, samples that is also there. So, all the wounded specimens we are taking or considering. Then the next thing is we put a spray paint. 
we have to have to uh, select a spray paint which is of a unique color or a distinct color. So here we have chosen a spray paint which is white in color. So this spray paint has to be handled very carefully. If you spray the specimen from a very close purview, it is going to create not a spray but a complete layer. If you spray it from a long distance, it is not, uh, there will be a lot of gaps between, between the spray particles. You want to select a very optimal distance through research. Uh, so that you spray all these specimens in a way that the particles are very close uh, to each other but of different shapes of course because you do not have control of how the spray particles are throwing on the surface, right. All the spray particles are a very unique thing, right. So during a test along with the spray particles, what you do is you capture a video. You capture a high definition video and you put this video into a post processing DIC software. What the DIC software does is it breaks down the video into multiple frames and figures out that a particular particle, let us say particle number 1 of the uh, spray, how has this moved over time? For a 50 seconds test, has it moved 1 millimeter or 2.5 millimeter on the x, y and z, all the three directions? How has it moved? Here we are specifically looking at x and y assuming the uh, from a planar standpoint. There is 3D DIC also, but this is we are talking about a 2D DIC. So, let us assume Y is the direction of loading and X is the orthogonal direction. So, along the X and Y, how each particle has moved? These particles are sometimes known as uh, in a zoomed version speckles, irregular speckles. So, they are irregular speckles because all of them look very different, right? So, the speckle patterns are tracked through the entire test and that gives the overall strain field. How each particle, so think about thousands of particles which are on this particular specimen, they have all moved by a certain displacement. All this trajectory of the displacements are all tracked by the post processing software. Once you upload the video and uh, cut it into different frames, right? And that will give you the strain field. So, uh, let us take a look on the uh, right side, we are looking at uh, this AR, uh, AR is basically the aspect ratio of a wound which we have come up with. We wanted to look, look at that if you have a very long wound versus a short wound, how would they, uh, what kind of strain fields do you see due to that, right? So, let us take a look. So, this is how a DIC setup or a final set of results look like, right? So, uh, you are looking at these uh, different stages. So, frame uh, 1 on the very top left, T is equal to 2 seconds. So, while you are doing the test and you are uh, taking the video, this is a T is equal to 2 seconds. Then you have a T is equal to 24 seconds. This is the frame 8 based on how I have broken down the entire video into let us say 30 or 40 frames, right? Then at T equal to 57 seconds, which is my frame 12 in this case, uh, I see the specimen has elongated quite a bit. So, we are looking at this particular wound shape which is an elliptical wound and what we see is uh, with the colors the strains. These are uh, Lagrangian strains uh, sometimes known as, but you can compare them with one Vsys press, right? So, uh, one of the majority uh, part of this uh, upcoming sessions would be an introduction to finite element modeling of soft tissues, right? There we are going to get all this colored maps of strain, uh, strain localization, how the strain is distributed, how the stress is distributed, these kind of things we are going to learn, right? So, the digital image correlation allows us to compare the experimental results with the computational results like what you get from finite element modeling and validate the finite element model, right? So, that is why D, this DIC technique is very, very uh, often used in the industry as a validation tool. Also, it is a good tool to understand the local mechanics of the soft tissue. So, overall is okay, like overall property due to a wound is something, but what is happening at the local level? What is happening at the periphery of the wound, right? So, what we can see very clearly is in frame 1, we have some red zones around the wound, right? As we go to frame number 8, this red zone has now been localized on the left side, right? That means you have a very high strain zone followed by all the very, very low strain zones which are the purple and the blue, right? Whenever you have this kind of a condition, that zone or that local point 
is highly susceptible to a fracture or a rupture. So, please remember as a rule of thumb whenever you have a low very high strain zone surrounded by a low strain distribution that means that is a place from which a fracture can initiate. This is a point of concern and finally, what you do see in frame 12 is uh, the uh, strain localization is still where it should be and finally, that place encounters a fracture from that location. There is some curling in the specimen and that is where uh, the specimen is going to break when we when you push it or pull it uh, even more right. So, this is uh, very valuable information uh, and this is unique to every wound shape. If I change it change this to a long wound it is going to give a very different story here like in terms of local loading right. This is very important to know because this is how you know the wound is going to behave in the different cycles of healing. So, whenever you get a wound on your body typically what happens is uh, that particular portion of the skin is missing right. So, there is a lot of fibroblast and other things like biochemical operations which happens to create a healing, but you will see commonly a stretched skin on the side because you have a different material at the portion of the wound and you have a very stretched skin on the side which is not able to apply all the natural tensions properly which is usually all balanced when you do not have a wound right. So, you see a very stretched skin that is the biaxial loading of the skin or so these kind of loadings can uh, cause the wound to not heal properly sometimes if you are not selecting the right kind of stitching or right kind of healing operation right. So, that is why understanding what is happening at the local level for different wound shapes is of utmost importance. Another application of this is when a surgeon is going to do some operation let us say open heart surgery or trying to operate on the stomach he has to cut certain portions or make certain incisions to reach to an organ. What is the correct type of cut or incision which is there? Is it an op oval cut or is it a circular cut or is it a straight cut? What kind of cut is ideal? By ideal I mean what cut is going to heal after the operation very quickly. So, these kind of information can only be learnt if you look at the local mechanics of the soft tissue. So, these wounds can be compared with the cuts it is very similar to the cuts right. So, on the right side what you are seeing is we are doing a very very close particle tracking at four different points in the wound we have zoomed into the wound and we are tracking the different strains which are generated at this four different points and what, what we do see is uh, the point on the very uh, left which is P1 is showing the maximum amount of strain build up and we clearly get the value in the time frame what the value of the strain is and this also reiterates that that is the point of the highest localized strain uh, development and that is the possible point of rupture right. Okay. So, let us talk about the next application of uh, soft tissue simulants which is uh, for the testing of artificial skin grafts using simulants right. So, let us take a very quick snapshot of uh, what uh, skin grafting is. So, skin grafting is a technique uh, which is applied when somebody has experienced a very severe kind of burn injury or injury which has led to removal or damage to a lot of skin right. So, whenever a lot of skin is damaged on the body then uh, the body cannot heal itself or normal suturing is not good enough. So, you need to place a skin graft which is nothing, but you take a healthy piece of skin from another location of the same human body typically from the thigh region. So, you take this healthy piece of skin you create a pattern with this this is known as a slit pattern using a uh, device which is known as a skin graft meshing device and using this pattern this allows the skin to expand to a certain version. So, just the normal skin is not going to expand. So, you take a small piece of skin create this pattern and now you can expand the skin and place it on the place of injury and then suture it and this will allow the skin to heal much more quickly right. So, this is usually the technique of grafting. So, in very severe injuries where somebody has lost like uh, has a 30 percent burn or 40 percent burn or something more you cannot be extracting so much skin out of the human thigh that will cause the person to suffer even more 
right sometimes you take skin from uh, you know like other cadavers and other places but that's not very successful so typically it's an autograph like from where you take skin from the same body but the primary concern here is skin is very very expensive in the area of burns so can you take a very small piece of skin and place a very unique pattern rather than a normal slitting pattern which can allow the skin to expand beyond its limit four or five times so that you can cover a very very large area so that is the problem research problem which we are trying to solve through this research so let us dig in more so the expansion of the skin grafts play a key role in treating severe burn injuries like i mentioned in this work the expansion potential of skin grafts expansion potential is how much they can expand skin grafts with a novel rotating triangle shaped oxetic incision patterns were investigated what is an oxetic oxetic is a very unique uh, type of material configuration it is sometimes known as meta material if you just look up meta material you will see what oxetics are so like any soft tissue when you pull a sample of soft tissue it contracts in the middle in oxetics you have the same soft tissue with certain patterns when you pull it it will not contract but it will expand this is the theory of oxetics it is known as negative poisson's ratio material or an expanding material and this expansion is just by the virtue of the pattern which is within that material right so uh, one of the common patterns here is known as a rotating triangle pattern this have been uh, carefully curated through a lot of research uh, which is uh, ongoing in the world of oxidic meta materials right so we had picked this uh, uh, rotating triangle shape so a skin simulant was developed to test try and test this uh, new unique kind of patterning which we cannot do in a cadaver skin that easily because it's scanty and has a lot of ethical clearance issues here we can do it like without any ethical clearance right and uh, you don't want to do it on a live human tissue because this has not been proven we just want to test it like we're using a different pattern and see whether the expansion is larger than what is there in the industry right so the skin simulant was employed in a range of uh, rotating triangle configurations with internal angles angles varying from 0 to 135 these are different pattern configurations right we are tested through the development of skin graft simulants so when we created grafts using the skin simulant we are calling them as skin graft simulants so that has just the patterns within the skin simulants right so mechanical testing on a utm and digital image correlation both were used to characterize the poisson's effect or how much is the expansion rather than contraction right or what is the overall poisson's effect the meshing ratios how much has the skin expanded so meshing ratio is nothing but the uh, expanded volume divided by the initial volume of any material right and the induced stresses of the skin graft simulants while we are expanding the skin we do not want to go beyond the ultimate tensile strength of skin at any point because that may cause the skin to break right so there are a lot of parameters we need to be careful we cannot be expanding skin to infinity we can expand it to a certain limit beyond that the ultimate tensile stress point may be reached and the skin may break from certain points we cannot be stretching it beyond limits right so such experimental findings on expansion potentials and estimations of mechanical properties with oxetic skin graft simulants have not been studied or reported to date and would be indispensable for further research in skin graft expansion so without the skin graft simulants or the skin simulants we can never do this research right so uh, here is a schematic of the skin grafting on the right side and i have explained how the skin looks like and grafting is basically like i had mentioned you take a small piece of skin and basically expand it through meshing and place it on the burn region right let's go further so these are the different designs uh, of uh, oxetic rotating triangle shapes which we developed the first uh, picture in any design you are looking at the unit cell which is uh, the primary unit of this and uh, on the second and the third picture you are looking at the overall sample where all these unit cells patterns are distributed right so the rotating triangle is nothing but it's a triangle which kind of opens up right at 0 degree it is completely like a y shaped pattern at uh, 135 degrees it's almost like a hexagon right so this is how the pattern is like this is the geometrical modeling of the oxetic patterns so next what we did was we created molds for this patterns through reverse designing on cad modeling and these molds were used to cast the skin simulant material to develop skin graft simulants 
So, what you are looking at the right side are the skin graft simulants, left side are the 3D printed molds, right. So, 3D printing has been immensely beneficial for us. So, all the skin graft simulants are now uh, clearly marked 0 to 135. The geometrical auxetic models were used to develop the negative uh, graft molds uh, and uh, 3D printers like I said were used to develop the final skin simulant material. Skin simulant material we had already explained, we have the composition for that, right. So, this is what we used for further testing. So, now we have put a spray on this all these test specimens as well like it is a little black spray because that was giving the right contrast with the uh, background which was skin color. You can see the UTM configuration where uh, all the samples have been developed in a way that a uh, lot of the samples are not eaten away by the clamp ends right that is why we have that extra edge extra ex extra edge. So, now they are all clamped and tested under tension right all these different samples. So, while we do this we are also recording a video using the camera and uh, we will be post processing the data to look at the local strengths what I have just explained with TIC. So, this is what we find out very very interesting results. Uh, so, uh, from a uh, Poisson's ratio standpoint, uh, Poisson's ratio typically is from 0 to 0 0.5 uh, from normal materials, uh, but here the Poisson's effect is very unique. So, we are looking at an overall Poisson's ratio which is changing as you go from 0 degree rotating triangle shape configuration to a 135 degree from negative 0.9, negative Poisson's ratio means this is expanding, positive Poisson's ratio means it is contracting right during a uniaxial tension test. So, we see a negative Poisson's ratio which is slowly getting converted to a positive Poisson's ratio when you are using a different configuration. So, this clearly says that the Poisson's effect is the maximum in the 0 degree configuration because this is a lot of chance of opening up right which is intuitive. We also compared the engineering stress how much stress is developed in each of these samples overall stress that is through a UTM test right. So, we have uh, uh, plotted the engineering stress versus engineering strain. We have also looked at the digital image correlation results on the right side where we are looking at the imaging based results and uh, we are seeing uh, places where you see a lot of holes or voids within the final stretch specimen when you try to expand it. These voids are not desirable right. If you have a lot of void between the burnt skin it is not going to the cells are not going to proliferate and the skin is not going to heal that quickly. So, ideally what you need is you need a configuration or a skin graft in future which has a configuration or a uh, you know like a sh uh, shape of pattern uh, which is very unique in a sense that it is not giving rise to a lot of stresses. So, that the skin may break that is not ideal it should not create a lot of voids right it should create a lot of expansion. So, there are three important parameter outputs which have we have to be careful about like while designing artificial skin graft simulation. Right. So, with that we also looked at the meshing ratio which is the expansion ratio from 0 degree to 135 degree it has been closely decreasing. So, now we can very clearly pick that 0 degree is the most appropriate uh, you know uh, this one uh, uh, appropriate configuration for which this will allow you a lot of uh, you know like uh, expansion possibilities with a low stress development and a limited void set up. So, these uh, we ran a battery of tests, we did a lot of research, this is well published, you can look it up and uh, this is where uh, a lot of these techniques were developed. Okay. So, the next example of uh, the soft tissue testing uh, or using soft tissue simulants is uh, of testing of a hernial mesh. What is a hernial mesh? Hernial mesh is a mesh which is uh, mesh material which is used for repair of a hernia. Hernia is nothing but when you have an organ pro trying to protrude out of a soft spot in the skin or soft spot, spot in the muscle and then it finally comes out it is an extremely painful process typically happens around the abdominal region majority of us would know what hernia is right. Mm -hmm. So, an organ is trying to uh, come out of basically the uh, fat part and uh, so typically how this is operated is you want to put this organ back surgically into where it came from and put a surgical mesh which is usually uh, built up of a polypropylene or a plastic uh, semi plastic or polymeric material 
and uh, that mesh usually forms a hammock which doesn't allow this organ to come back and you stitch this mesh mesh on the side as if like you've just blocked a hole right so this is how hernia repair surgeries are uh, conducted but you have uh, close to uh, uh, this this is uh, this number is huge we are looking at 2 crore hernia repair surgeries per year this is from literature hernia surgeries with prosthetic meshes have a lot of recalls and have a lot of issues some of the common issues which are reported across uh, or around the globe are pain and infection which is a biological issue that you cannot correct through study of any mechanics, hernia re reoccurrence, mesh contraction and mesh failure. These are the three different areas which we have identified about the hernia mesh issue which can have uh, an effect due to the loading, the incorrect amount of loading which is getting applied on the mesh that is probably causing the meshes to fail we wanted to study this more. So, majority of the literature studies so far have focused on mesh biocompatibility uh, which is uh, basically to look at whether the mesh is compatible within the body and that has been done through animal models and dry and wet mechanical test where a mesh has just been pulled in different directions and through uniaxial and biaxial loading this has been understood that how the mesh behaves. But this is not exactly what is going on inside the human body you have the mesh typically sutured with a soft tissue and you want to study the interaction between the mesh and the soft tissue. So, the literature gap here is lack of mesh and human tissue interaction tests and one of the reason this is not there is lack of human tissues itself. You cannot be taking an abdominal tissue that quickly and running these tests, right. So, we decided to come up with a soft tissue simulant which uh, simulates the pelvic tissue or the abdominal tissue and we created, uh, we took a real mesh from, uh, this is from proline mesh from Ethicon and uh, we from Johnson and Johnson and basically we took this mesh and we basically sutured this mesh along with uh, uh, the soft tissue simulant, how it is originally sutured in a real, uh, you know, suturing scenario or a surgical scenario and we ran some overall tests to look at the overall property in a UTM, we also developed a finite element model to study the same what is happening at the local uh, region, right. We studied this at different strain rates also because these different kinds of movements are experienced during uh, different uh, gait cycles, right. So, we did all these experiments and some of the very interesting results which we found out is for stretch or strain less than 0 0.5, the tissue is the major load bearing component. However, when the strain increases, overall strain uh, increases over 0 0.5, the prosthetic mesh underwent permanent deformation. So, after a certain strain, the prosthetic mesh was going through some deformation and there was minimal effect of strain rates indicating that the prosthetic mesh was a dominant load bearing component. So, the figure on the right is just showing some of the results where we are looking at just the prosthetic mesh uh, stress strain profile, just the pelvic tissue surrogate or the simulant stress strain profile and the overall sutured composite model stress strain profile. So, sutured model is lying in between the uh, prosthetic mesh and the uh, tissue surrogate, tissue is softer, mesh is stiffer and the overall property is between that. So, uh, other things which we did find out and very interesting result, we found out that there is a lot of stress concentration on the prosthetic mesh strands when we zoom in, this is through computational modeling, where due to the unit cell, how the mesh is looking like from a pattern standpoint, that is very unique. So, this is, this was a very key finding. So, the pattern of the mesh has a very unique implication on how the mesh could possibly fail. So, this is a very important clinical information which it's, which a doctor would not know. So, this is reported in one of the publication when we, uh, where we did this extensive research both experimentally and computationally and finally found out that the culprit here is the mesh design. So, if we can control the mesh design properly and have the right unit cells, then the stresses could be less and the meshes could possibly fail less. This is an ongoing research. So, we are going to conduct tests on different mesh designs, right. So, this is, uh, these are, these were a set of examples which I wanted to just take to just showcase that what is the importance of overall soft tissue simulants and how this is widely applicable uh, in different research scenarios, right. So, with that I would like to conclude this session and uh, stay tuned for more exciting lectures uh, upcoming in this course, right. Thank you.